Hello, today I'm going to talk about a topic that has received hardly any attention in volcanology, namely, can we prevent very large eruptions? Now, obviously, if we can prevent large eruptions, we can also prevent small ones. But the large ones and the very large ones that I discuss and define later, those are the greatest concern to humankind. But before we go to discuss the uh, methods of preventing large eruptions, let's look at the eruption sizes, starting with the small ones. Now here we have a tiny eruption formed in 1984 in the Krabla volcano in North Iceland. You can see the top of the feeder dike here, and later on in the next slide, I will show you the feeder dike here, in this area here. Obviously the lava flow, basaltic lava flow, is tiny and the feeder dike just made it to the surface. If you look at the next one, we see that the feeder dike here was just able to reach the surface. It obviously had a high density basaltic magma, just made it to the surface, but could hardly issue any basaltic lava in this part here. Now, obviously we all agree that this is a tiny, a tiny lava. Now, many eruptions look impressive like this one in Mount Redoubt in Alaska, the 1990 eruption. Uh, very nice uh, eruption column, if you can say that. And the same applies to the next one from Mount Augustine in Alaska in March 2006. In fact, this one here is particularly striking because the eruption column forms a beautiful pattern in the sky. Similarly, there was a nice eruption column, if you can use that phrase, uh, in the early stages, particularly of the Eyjafjallajökull 2010 eruption, an eruption that caused a lot of trouble for the air traffic. But all these impressive eruptions in, in Alaska and here in Eyjafjallajökull were small. The eruptive volumes were between 0.03 and 0.3 cubic kilometers. So these are clearly small eruptions. Then we go to Hawaii and we see here lava flow as, as seen in the Kilauea in 1987. Now obviously the volumetric flow rate, the volume per unit time here coming out is, is, is tiny here, small. But this eruption lasted from 19 83 to 2018, so nearly 35 years. And if the cumulative lava is calculated, as the US Geological Survey has done, the total eruptive lava over, this over these 35 years is around 4.4 cubic kilometers. That is what I would call a moderate eruption. Similarly, in Balvabunga in 2014 to 2015 in Iceland, the eruptive volume, the lava, basaltic lava again, was somewhere between one and two cubic kilometers. The, the exact, exact volume is a little bit debated, but I use here 1.2, which is from the last or the most recent paper on, on this topic, Bonnier Dahlia 2018. Now, in addition, particularly for Kiloea and Balvabunga, we are talking about long feeder dikes. For example, in Balabunga, the feeder dike was somewhere between 45 and 50 kilometers long. So if we want to know, if we want to know exactly the amount of magma that left the, the, the source magma chamber or the source reservoir, we need to add the volume of the feeder dike. And in the case, for example, of, of uh, Balabunga, we are talking about uh, volume of the order of cubic kilometers and may have been similar in Kilo Air. Now we are coming to a little bit larger eruption. Here is the famous 27 kilometer long 1783 Laki fissure in Iceland. In A we see it in winter and in B in summer. Uh, and it contains around 140 crater cones. You see many of them here and produced around 15 cubic kilometers of basaltic lava. So it was a large effusive eruption. But in addition, as said earlier, given that the, uh, the volcanic fissure at the surface is 
27 kilometers long. The feet attack is at least that long and may have been longer at greater depth in, in, in the crust. So we'd, we would have to add maybe one or two cubic kilometers to, to this volume here to estimate the total, the total volume of, of magma that left the reservoir or the magma chamber or even more. The largest historical eruption is presumably the 1815 eruption of Tambora in Indonesia. It produced something like 160 cubic kilometers of pyroclastic material, maybe tephra, and is regarded, as I say, as the largest historical eruption. When we calculated as dense rock, or DRE, which is similar to the volume of magma, then we are talking about 50 cubic kilometers. In this case, the, the dike was presumably tiny. There was a big collapse called that are forming here, as you see in B. Uh, but the dike volume was probably tiny in comparison with the 50 cubic kilometers, so we don't really need to, to add that to the, the volume leaving the chamber. But when we go further back in time, we see much, much larger eruption, much larger than Tambora. For example, in the Western United States, there have been many eruptions or aspects based on the distribution of aspects from the cold eras of Yellowstone and Long Valley. And we see that some of these aspects cover a large fraction of the United States. So obviously we are talking about hundreds of cubic kilometers, even in cases, thousands of cubic kilometers. Here is a list of several of the very large eruptions from Yellowstone. 2.2 million years ago, 2,500 cubic kilometers, 630,000 years ago, 1,000 cubic kilometers, and so on. And in comparison, Tambora, with its 50 or even 160, if you, if you look at the eruptive materials as, as pyroclastics or, or, or tephra, is, is relatively small in comparison with these gigantic eruptions. Not to speak of St. Helens, which was around one cubic kilometer and, and is, is very small in comparison here. The largest eruption in the history of Homo sapiens occurred in Topa some 75,000 years ago. It produced at least 2,800 cubic kilometers calculated as dense rock or as magma. There is no doubt, there is no doubt that this eruption had huge impact on the climate. It led to large scale cooling on, on the earth. How much people debate about, but there is some sort of volcanic winter happened as a consequence of this eruption. Uh, as I say, the magnitude of the cooling and the duration of the cooling are both debated. And so is a theory, so-called bottleneck theory, that this eruption may have led to drastic reduction in the number of humans living, uh, so-called bottleneck theory, where people have proposed that the number of Homo sapiens following the eruption may have gone down to say 3,000 or 10,000, 10,000 people. But, what is not in doubt is that an eruption of this kind, which I call a very large eruption, would have devastating effects on humankind if it occurred today. There is no doubt about that. So how do we classify the sizes of eruptions? Well, the best known is probably the Volcanic Explosivity Index, or VEI, which takes into account the eruptive volume, the eruptive column height, and the duration of the eruption. Obviously, this index is very useful, but it's mostly useful for explosive eruptions, and particularly for explosive historical eruptions, because then we would know the height of the eruptive column and the duration of the eruption. It is less useful for effusive eruptions. Also shown here are division of the sizes into small, moderate, large, and very large. There is no accepted definition of, of these. And in this talk, 
I use the following definition. I call an eruption small if it's less than 0.1 cubic kilometers in eruptive materials, moderate if it's 0.1 to 10, and large if it's greater than 10 cubic kilometers. So how is the volume distribution of eruptions? What, what, what kind of distribution does it follow? Well, it follows a power law, which is a part of the heavy tail distributions. How, how can we decide if it's a power law? There are various statistical techniques. The simplest one, and one that's very commonly used, is as, as a, at least a first approximation, is to take a log, log plot, a bi-logarithmic plot, and see if the distribution follows a straight line. Now this one does roughly follows the straight blue line. It can be a line with, with uh, it can be more than one line, the line can be broken, and then there is usually a difference in the mechanics. But here we see that volcanic eruptions follow power law. Power laws are extremely common, both in human society and also in nature. Earthquake magnitudes, thicknesses of lava flows, sizes of crater cones, lengths of volcanic fissures, like lengths of tectonic fractures, they all follow power laws. Let's look at some examples before we carry on. We measured the uh, diameters, the largest diameters of the 140 crater cones of the Lackey volcanic fissure, and they show a nice power law size distribution. Here on the, in A, we have an ordinary plot, and in B, we have a bilogarithmic plot or log log plot. We see a, a, a break in, in, in the plot here, in the straight line. That means there are two straight lines that fit with the distribution, meaning that where they change, the slope is changing, there was probably a change in the mechanics of, of, uh, of the crater cone formation. This is quite common. For example, we see often such a break when we take tectonic fractures and at a certain, at a certain length, there is a break indicating that the shorter fractures are mainly tension fractures, the longer ones may be in a rift zone normal faults. Here are the thickness distributions of dikes and inclined seats in a, in a paleo or, or in a fossil volcano in Iceland. And we see that uh, uh, most of them, of course, are thin and a few ones are thick. And this is what characterizes power laws, namely, there are many small objects, many small processes, hair thicknesses, and very few large ones, and very few large ones. And that is in fact the same as applies to volcanic eruptions. We could say fortunately, most volcanic eruptions are very small, comparatively speaking, and a few ones are very, very large. And we see that listed here as regards frequency. How often can we expect to get eruptions of certain magnitude or certain size? Well, obviously, when I speak here now, there are probably uh, 20 volcanoes erupting in the world at this moment. So if we look at those eruptions that really concern us, those are, are indicated in red here. Eruptions giving volumes of 100 to 1,000 cubic kilometers, they occur maybe one one such eruption occurs every 10,000 years. These can have, well, strong or devastating effects on, on human society. And not to speak of those larger than 1,000 uh, cubic kilometers, th which I say here occur once every 50,000 years. This is a sort of an average because estimates range from one such eruption maybe every 17, 18,000 years to one such eruption every 100,000 years. Obviously the data is, is limited because the, these eruptions are not very common. So very large eruptions of the order of 1,000 cubic kilometers obviously pose a catastrophic risk to humankind. What does it mean? It means such eruptions have the potential of, of destroying modern civilization. Now the large eruptions we know on the planet they have volumes of around 5,000 cubic kilometers and applies both to 
effuse eruption, lava flows, and explosive eruptions, uh, pyroclastic flows and then fall deposits. So those may pose existential risk to humankind. What does it mean? It means that they could possibly lead to extinction of humans. Here is one example uh, of, of very large lava flows in, in, in the world. People have mapped many of the individual flows of the Columbia River bus of the United States and according to those maps and estimates some of them individual lava flows have reached 5,000 cubic kilometers, 5,000 cubic kilometers, which is similar to the largest uh, explosive uh, eruption, tephra, tephra or ash layers uh, that we find. So, so 5,000 cubic kilometers, I've seen larger figures, but 5,000 may be somewhere close to the upper limit of possible eruptions on, on, on Earth. Of course, there are many other risks to human life. Of course, there are human-made risks, but we are not going to discuss those. Natural ones include the meteorological impacts or cometic impacts, changes in planetary orbits, geomagnetic reversals, radiation for nearby supernovas, and so on. But, but as regards frequency or potentially catastrophic or existential risks, very large eruptions are probably the most dangerous ones. I just show here the Barringer Crater, the meteor crater in Arizona in America. That was not a very, very big one, not a very big uh, impact, but just to show you an example of an impact crater. The question is now, can we do anything about these very large eruptions, perhaps even pre prevent them? Well, to prevent a large volcanic eruption, we first have to understand the energy that drives them. And in thermodynamics, we distinguish between three types of systems. Isolated systems receive neither energy nor matter. This is an idealization and the only known um, Isolated system would in fact be the universe as a whole, assuming there is only one universe. Uh, modern, modern ideas uh, also talk about multiverse, but we are not going in, in, in that direction. So the universe as a whole uh, could be regarded as an isolated system, receiving neither energy from outside nor matter. Closed, closed system, those receive energy, but no matter. Now the Earth itself is, is, is quite quite approximately a closed system. It receives a lot of energy from the sun, of course, but the material it receives every year is tiny in comparison with the mass of the Earth. It is this cosmic dust, but it's tiny addition to the mass, mass of the Earth. A volcano, however, is an open system because it receives energy, heat and work, and strain energy when it's uh, inflating, and of course, material magma. It's therefore an open system. So we have volcanoes classified in thermodynamics as an open, as an open system. They continuously receive new energy while they're active, partly in the form of heat, and of course materials as magma, and partly in the form of work and strain energy associated with loading. So one reason for difference in volume in eruptions is probably related to the energy available to drive the magma to the surface. Of course, part of the reason must be related to the size of the magma chamber or the magma reservoir supplying the magma to the eruption, but particularly within individual volcanoes over perhaps short period of time, the differences in volumes of, of uh, erupted uh, materials is presumably mostly related to the energy available to try the eruption. Now, nearly all magma erupts along or through feeder dikes or inclined seats. So these fractures, these magma filled fractures propagate to the surface and supply magma to the eruption. There are exceptions to that, but th this is the most common thing. So the energy needed is, first of all, to rupture the rock, so-called surface energy, 
and secondly b to open the fracture to move the fracture walls against sigma 3 the minimum principal compressive stress or the maximum tensile of stress when a magma chamber expands through magma being added to it the resulting displacement inflation as we call it implies of course work and it means storage or accumulation of strain energy in the volcano the new magma also brings of course thermal energy into the volcano we discussed that a little bit later so the main energy for magma chamber rupture and dike and seed formation derives from the strain energy associated with inflation and the displacement of the flux of the volcano here we see a nice example of an inflation of six volcanoes six calderas in the galapagos islands that seem to act in a perfect harmony so the whole whole volcanic area here with these six volcanoes is acting in harmony and when they all inflate they store strain energy that can be used to propagate dikes to the surface in case the unrest period leads to dike, dike injection. Of course, there is thermal energy. There's no question about that. Thermal energy comes from the magma being added to the, to the magma chamber. But thermal energy or heat is a low quality energy. It's a low quality energy and even if thermal stresses can either generate fractures during uh, during heating and also during cooling as we see here is a columnar joints formed during cooling of a sill in south iceland and even if those joints or fractures can be used as part of the path of a dike on an inclined sheet during the linking up the heat itself is or the thermal stress is not a basic cause of dike seed propagation is not the reason for dike propagation so back to strain energy here is an uh, inside inflation uh, Im image or, or series of images from uh, one of the uh, one of the calderas of Galapagos and it shows very nicely that there was a sill emplacement, presumably at two kilometers depth here from 1992 to 1999. And this sill emplacement led to inflation, and this inflation obviously led to storage of strain energy. So, can we estimate how much strain energy is stored during either sill emplacement like this one or simply addition of magma to a magma chamber? Well, for a sill like magma chamber, we can very easily we can in fact for any kind of any shape of magma chamber but let's take a sill one sill, sill like one like here the strain in its store to u zero is primarily a function of the excess pressure the magma pressure driving the inflation and the radius of the sill like chamber or the radius of the sill the excess pressure comes in in the second power the power of two Whereas the radius A comes in the third power, power of three. So clearly, the strain energy stored is extremely sensitive to the radius of the magma chamber, to the radius of, of the sill like magma chamber or the sill itself. And we can calculate for a given inflation if the strain energy stored is enough to provide the surface energy needed to propagate a typical feeder dike. To the surface here for example is a beautiful feeder dike in etna uh, showing the dike is 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 relatively thin in the stiff lava flow here and becomes much much thicker when it goes into compliant or soft scoria layer here and forms a v-shaped uh, feeder dike which is not uncommon so we can calculate that we can also calculate if the stored strain energy in a in a volcano is sufficient to generate say a large ring fault a large collapse caldera here we have las Cariades in tenerife it's a big collapse caldera here and the energy needed to form this caldera if it forms in a, in one event would be 10 to the 15 10 to the 16 joule 
Why is this range? Well, because we don't know exactly the depth of the ring fault. How, what is the depth to the, to the, this is the ring fault. What would be the depth to the magma chamber? Here's of course Tate has formed in the last 180,000 years inside or in the margin of the caldera. But in this case, I, I quickly add, this is not a single caldera, it's not a single caldera collapse. This is the oldest caldera, this is the second oldest, and this is the youngest one, and you can see the erosion is, is very different to those. So in this case, it was not formed in a single event, it was formed at least three events. But it's interesting that the, the biggest earthquakes recorded so far, uh, the Chile earthquake in 1960, released or transformed energy of the order of 10 to the 19 Joule. And if we calculate the energy released or transformed during the largest eruptions on the planet, providing 5,000 cubic kilometers of, of, of lava or pyroclastic materials, that gives you exactly the same energy transformed, namely 10 to the 19 Joule. So there may be a certain upper limit there may be a certain upper limit to how much strain energy can be stored either in a fault zone or in a, uh, in a volcanic system and released or transformed during eruption or earthquake propagation. So the ring fault would normally imply that the former ring fault or reactivate the ring fault normally implies an, in an inflation before it happens. And we can calculate from the inflation what is the strain energy available to, to either reactivate or cause the collapse. And remember, if the magma chamber, as is very common, is some sort of a sill like, then the strain energy depends on the radius of the chamber in the third power. And additional energy is, is often through the movements of the walls, but the, the uplift, the uh, inflation depends on the radius in the third power. So what is elastic strain energy? How can we visualize it? Well, elastic strain energy is potential energy. It's stored in the deformed elastic body, in this case, the crustal segment hosting the magma chamber and the volcano itself. It is released or rather transformed when the body the volcano returns to its original shape. And if you want to visualize it, you can do so here in the yellow illustrations. It is visualized as the area under the stress strain curve. Sigma is stress, epsilon is strain, and the straight line here is Young's modulus. The area here, shaded, is then the stored strain energy. If the material is very brittle, it tolerates very little strain energy before it fractures. This one is obviously a brittle material. This one here is tough. So there's more strain energy stored here before fracture. The fracture could be, say, either faulting, ring fault, or dike or seat emplacement. The amount of energy stored depends on the material properties of the volcano, and those properties can change from one eruption to another one or change over time for a given volcano. Of course, they're different between different volcanoes, but they can also change for a given volcano over time. One perhaps surprising result of this consideration is that basaltic edifices are weaker. They're more easily fractured than stratovolcanoes which means that basaltic volcanoes can store less strain energy before they fail, before they fracture, than stratovolcanoes. So, basaltic edifices fail at a lower strain energy threshold than stratovolcanoes. So when an eruption occurs in a stratovolcano, there is often more strain energy available to squeeze out the magma, to press out the magma, than would be in a similar uh, magma chamber situation for a basaltic edifice. I, I use the term basaltic edifice, but that's what very many people would call simply shield volcanoes like in Hawaii and Galapagos and, and, and so on. 
So now that we understand how the strain energy driving the magma is generated and stored, how can we pre prevent the large eruptions? Well, clearly by reducing the stored strain energy or alternatively, of course, the stress generating that energy. We come to that in a moment, but first briefly, can we possibly stop dikes that are already propagating during an unrest period through cooling? Can we do it through cooling? Here I show that idea in a very schematic uh, way, a uh, very simple way. First of all, of course, the dike propagation is often relatively rapid in comparison with at least the rate of drilling. So it's probably very unlikely we could possibly drill down to the dike that was already propagating. But let's assume we could do it. I take an example from Tenerife uh, indicating this kind of scenario. But let's assume we could do it. Uh, even if you could and pump water down there to cool the magma, either the magma tip, uh, the dike tip or the magma front, or somewhere in the middle of the dike. Even if you could do this, it would be of very little help. Why? Because the tensile strength of the solidified part of the dike, either the top or the middle part, would be very similar to the tensile strength of the host rock. So if there is any overpressure in the dike, it would simply either propagate through the solidified part or form an, find another way like, like these horns I indicate here, find another way and continue to propagate towards the surface. So to try to stop a propagating dike by, by cooling it is very unlikely to be successful, very unlikely to be successful. Another idea might be to try to cool or solidify an entire magma chamber or a large part of a magma chamber. That would normally not be feasible because first of all, it will take enormous time and of course enormous amount of water. And uh, during that time, uh, if, if the chamber is likely to erupt in a, in a large way, it would probably or at least possibly do so. Here's this famous uh, magma chamber in Chile uh, one of the best exposed shallow magma chambers, fossil magma chambers in the world. So the main idea I'm proposing here is to try to transform the roof of the chamber, the roof of the chamber into a seal, so as to minimize the likelihood of rupture and dike and seed injection. That we do, of course, by reducing the strain energy as well, and I remind you that seals can be maintained for millions of years on uh, hydrocarbon reservoirs. I'm not saying we are forming seals similar to those on hydrocarbon reservoirs, not at all, but I'm saying that in, in principle, we could transform a roof into a seal and keep the magma inside, even if magma is added to the magma chamber and it's slightly expanding. How? We do it by generating stress barriers. Stress barriers are layers or units in the roof of the magma chamber that prevent rupture, prevent dikes for, for, from propagating or inclined seeds from propagating through those layers. How do we form a stress barrier? Well, what is a stress barrier? Stress barrier is simply a layer, a unit, that has a state of stress unfavorable to dike or inclined seed propagation. It's simply a layer unit that does not allow dike or inclined seed propagation. And the easiest way to generate that kind of stress barrier in, in an active volcano is to change one or more layers into a state of stress that is lithostatic. Now, what is a lithostatic state of stress? It's a state of stress that is isotropic, meaning all the principal stress are equal, and the magnitude depends only on the overburden or geostatic pressure. That means the magnitude depends only on depth. The depth here is set, and if the density of the rock rho is, is equal in the whole roof, then it would, we would use this simple formula here. But of course, normally, the layers at different densities, and then we, we have 
density as a function, as a function of depth, and then uh, the uh, the uh, uh, lithostatic state of stress or the vertical stress will become uh, an integral. So, how do we bring the state of stress in units or layers close to lithostatic? Through hydro shearing. What is hydro shearing? Hydro shearing is a technique that has been used for decades to increase fracture related permeability in rocks for human made geothermal reservoirs. They used to be called hot dry rock or HDR, but they're now called enhanced geothermal systems, EGS. Of course, the strain energy in the roof is then reduced as well. So when a fracture in A here slips, when the fracture in A slips, then the, the irregularities that are normally on, on, such, a, on such a fracture, they, they make it nearly impossible that after the slip, the, the walls would fit perfectly together. There will normally be, like in B here, some openings. And these openings increase the permeability and allow cold water to flow through hot rock bodies and take up the heat and become geothermal resources. That is the idea behind hot dry rocks or, or, or enhanced geothermal systems. This has been done, as I say, for decades, producing both uh, hot water for space heating and, and, and electricity. Uh, here I show the main, main system for such an operation. It's not of very great concern here, um, but we have an injection well uh, for, the, for the cold water and then production wells for the hot water or the steam coming up. Uh, and uh, then, of course, a power plant here in, in seven for producing electricity. We can monitor how the reservoir, the, uh, how the hydro sharing is progressing through micro earthquakes. These are, these are micro earthquakes. Each point is, is, a, is, a, is, is a focal mechanism or hypercenter. And uh, we can monitor how it spreads out. And this, of course, we would use for, for the uh, for the sealing or for the, uh, for the preventing of, of volcanic eruption. We will monitor how large part of the roof has been, uh, has been uh, changed into a, 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 a close to lithostatic state of stress. So hydro shearing reduces the stress differences and brings the state of stress closer to lithostatic. And when the roof of the magma chamber is in a lithostatic state of stress, which I indicate here on this more circles with this uh, red dot here, yeah, it should of course have, uh, uh, strictly speaking, have zero area uh, or zero diameter, this red dot that I show it just like here. Then if the state of stress is lithostatic, then the magma chamber and the roof are in mechanical equilibrium, meaning that the magma pressure in the chamber is so that there is no tendency to magma chamber rupture and diacon seed injection. All faulting tends to reduce or minimize stress difference in the crust. And here I simply show this through more circles. So when the when, when on, on this illustration here, sigma three is the minimum and sigma one is the maximum, and we are simply through faulting, reducing the difference between these two, so the circle becomes smaller and smaller, and then there is no tendency to reach the so-called Coulomb line where you would have shear failures or faulting, or to reach uh, the condition for, for the formation of a, a dike or an inclined seat. So the basic idea, as I illustrate here in A, from a fossil magma chamber in southeast Iceland, Slevudalu, is to keep the roof in lithostatic equilibrium with the magma chamber. If that is the situation, then as we see here in B, there would be no tendency for magma chamber rupture and injection of dikes like we see here. So if we can keep the state of stress, through hydro sharing close to lithostatic in equilibrium with the magma chamber, even if the chamber is expanding, then 
we would prevent magma chamber rupture and therefore dike and seat injection. When we prevent dike and seat injection, we of course prevent uh, dikes and seeds to propagate to the surface to feed eruptions. We can keep on hyd hydro shearing again and again uh, in, in the volcano, in the roof of the volcano, so long as we wish. So we can keep the state, we can keep the uh, volcano from erupting, from forming uh, dikes and seeds as long as we wish, as we are able to provide the water and, and continue the hydro shearing. So there would therefore be no tendency for eruption. So hydro shearing triggers numerous small faults and earthquakes and minimizes the stress difference in the chamber roof or any layer that we want to apply the method to, as well as of course minimizing the strain energy. Hydro shearing therefore brings the state of stress in the roof close to lithostatic where all the principal stresses are the same and equal to the overburden pressure. For such a state of stress, there is no tendency, there is no tendency to any brittle deformation, either through faulting or dike seed injection. So the hydro shearing transforms the roof or layer within, within the roof into a stress barrier, into a seal that prevents dike seed injections and therefore eruptions. And you could say the beauty of this idea is that uh, because this hydro sharing would, of course, yield geothermal energy that can be used for power stations, it is not unlikely that the whole uh, method could be entirely economic. Of course, many injections wells would be needed and repeatedly made during the, uh, uh, during the evolution of any, any very dangerous volcano like Topa here, Topa here. And of course, a lot of water would be needed. Much of the water can be, be uh, reused, but we need a lot of water. Fortunately, many of these dangerous volcanoes, the big volcanoes, are, are collapsed cold areas with lakes. So there's plenty of water available to, to do the hydro sharing. Of course, the method can be used for preventing small and moderate eruptions, as I said in the beginning, but the large ones, the very large ones, are those of greatest concern to, to humankind. So to conclude, very large vol volcanic eruptions of the order of many hundred cubic kilometers or, or thousands of cubic kilometers pose at least a catastrophic risk, and some may even pose an existential risk to humankind. So preventing such large eruption from happening is of vital importance for humankind. We will live on this planet for hundreds and thousands, or tens of thousands of years, and it is likely that we will see some very large eruption during those times if we don't prevent them. So the main method proposed here is hydro sharing of the host rock, the, the roof of the of the magma chamber or the reservoir to reduce the likelihood of magma chamber rupture and of course to reduce the strain energy available in case in case one say tiny dike would escape somewhere to the surface. Now hydro sharing triggers numerous small fault slips and brings the state of stress closer to lithostatic thereby making all the principal stresses equal and equal to the overburden pressure and of course reducing the strain energy. When the state of stress is lithostatic, there is no tendency to brittle deformation of any kind, including faulting of course and dike seat injection. So hydro sharing transforms the roof into a stress barrier, a seal that should be able to prevent dike seat propagation and thereby eruptions. Of course, of course, we need to test this idea and we could start by testing on some small magma chambers that are far from, uh, from, uh, from any, any, any humans and see how this, this method works. But I think that I can repeat what I said earlier. 
uh, for humankind living here on this planet for the next thousands of years, we need to look into possibilities of how, how to prevent large, very large eruptions. For those of you who uh, like to uh, learn a little bit more about these ideas, particularly how to prevent volcanic eruptions or large volcanic eruptions, uh, that topic is discussed in detail in chapter 10 of this book on volcano tectonics. And with these words, I say simply, thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye.